It is 12.59. Good afternoon from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I'm Jackson Williams. In NFL news, the NFL's Compensation Committee announced that Roger Goodell has had his contract extended through March of 2027. That will give Commissioner Goodell 20 years of service when that contract is set to expire. The Cardinals have designated quarterback Kyler Murray to return from injured reserve after he tore his ACL late last season. In AFC South news, the Colts have announced that Anthony Richardson will undergo season-ending shoulder surgery. The fourth overall pick will only appear in four games for his rookie season. In former Titans news, seven-time Pro Bowl wide receiver Julio Jones is signing a one-year deal with the Philadelphia Eagles. Jones will be reunited with his former Titans teammate, A.J. Brown, who pushed for Tennessee to trade for him from Atlanta. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, you need to visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Let's do this. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. What's up, everybody? Happy hump day to you. The hitman is off today. He has some well-earned R&R. He got the greatest weather. He's going to be hanging out for a few days. So I got to hang out with the... I got to find other guys to hang out with other former Titans. I mean, I'm just lost if I don't have a Titan to talk to every day for a couple hours. Slipping into some pink headphones across from me on a pink microphone is none other then the leading kickoff return man in franchise history, Mark Mariani, hey, who joins us. What's going on, man? I'm looking at myself in the uh, in the web chat. How do these pink How do these pink headphones look? They look good on me. It's they your color. Good. Is this my color? Yeah, yeah. You, What's up, man? What do you know, man? What Thanks have you been for doing? having me. This yeah. is this is so much fun. Thanks for answering the call. We put out the bat signal. Hey, man. Listen, keep me in the bullpen. You know I'm always ready. Um, I got to be honest with you though, Mickey. You're one of the most positive dudes I know. Yeah. And I know we're going to talk a lot of Titans football, but I'm going to need you today, man. I'm going to need you. Your Twitter turned kind of dark on I'm, Sunday. I am. I, You're a positive guy, but I you look like a guy who was tweeting wise, oh, almost a man. broken spirit. For the for the guy who's driving the uh, the fan bus and and living with every two tone blue uh, up and down, it's it was a rough go for me <laughs> Sunday morning, and it was early too, right? We got the eight thirty kickoff. Yep. Which really started the day off, uh, you know, in a negative aspect. But hey, that's why I'm here with you, and I know you're gonna lift me out of it. But I can't wait to talk about it, and uh, hopefully, there's a lot more. Hopefully, we went into that dip and get a little bit more upswing here on the way out of this buy. Uh, I I don't know if I have that kind of power. I I, I don't know. I, I want to start with this though, because I, if you don't know Mark, if you're new to Nashville, Mark was a a, a Titan and a Bear and then a Titan again in his career and was a, a, a Pro Bowl return man. So we certainly need to talk about the return game today and what the Titans are seeing, especially from the punt return game. But when this offseason played out, there was this national narrative, this is a rebuild. You know, all the national writers, every national writer just kind of, oh, well, the Titans are rebuilding, so off to the next team. And, and, and when we were watching around here, it's like, I mean, you still have Derrick Henry and you still have Ryan Tannehill. To me, that doesn't feel like a rebuild, even though you're changing 40-something percent of the team around them. It feels like you're maybe trying to make one last run at it. And then they get D-Hop, and I'm telling myself, like, why would you get him if it's a rebuild? Why in the world would you spend that kind of yeah. money for a veteran like that? And Big Jeff got paid, and, you know, Meyer took his pay cut, but he didn't leave. And so I started kind of convincing myself, like, well... Maybe they got a little something. They're going to put some duct tape on there. They're going to try to hold this thing together, see where it can land one more time. Well, so far it has crash landed <laughs> one more time. As you were watching things, what was your impression of what they were doing? Well, first of all, when you say rebuild, it slides off the tongue so you know so easily. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know who it's easy for is you know or easy or easier for are. You know the front office and ownership who who have a, a you know a future and longevity. Well, who it's really hard for are the guys in the locker room and the coaches and the guys going to work every single day. I don't know a lot of alpha alpha males and competitive dudes inside of a locker room that would be okay with signing up for a rebuild. Yeah. Um, you know, this early in the season or in the off season or whatever it may be, the national narrative always sort of 
you know, puts the Titans in the back seat, which is fine. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think sitting here as a Monday morning quarterback and, and, and being a fan now and, you know, having to watch it from the sidelines, a lot of things were positive. I felt, I felt good about a, a lot of things going into the season. I feel like we were headed in the back in the right direction and all those things in this defense and D hop and, and uh, trailing and some of these guys mm-hmm. that were going to take the next step, which we could talk more about. Um, but I think the biggest issue and the biggest elephant in the room, especially on the offensive side of the ball that we talked about and we hammered and we've relelentlessly beat this horse is this offensive line Two and years, not just before not, this season, yeah. but also before last season. Yeah. And so a lot of what we can c- complain about and, you know, a lot of the Derrick Henry production and a lot of the Tannehill stuff, the roots of this problem go back to this offensive line. And we knew it are, I think you're seeing the results of a couple, two, three, four years of pretty mediocre draft picks I think with this roster. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I, I think mean, you're being kind. I mean, we could get where we could get more into, you know, deeper into it, but <clears throat> It's it's very it was very hard and frustrating for me and it has been to watch this offense. I think Tim Kelly, um, what I like about him is he's not he's not so predictable. Uh, he is mixing it up, but I'll tell you, I'm so sick and tired of watching these tight splits and these tight formations and all these dudes. I mean, I don't know. Uh, again, Monday morning quarterback. I'd have to sit down with him and ask him. I don't understand some of the stuff we're doing on offense, um, and I think it it really gets highlighted because we have five offensive linemen who can't win man to man consistently on every single play. We're losing the battle at the point of attack every play, and you're watching Derrick Henry get twelve to fifteen one to two yard runs a game, and it's just it's just a massively crippling our offense. When you go first and 10 to second and nine or second and 10. Um, and then, you know, his, his stats will look okay because like on Sunday you can rip off a 65 yarder and, and all that. But the, but in reality, it's just a limony snickets, a series of unfortunate events. It's just one guy making a mistake after another, the lack of discipline. And it's, it's, it's frustrating to watch. Um, I'm sure it's frustrating to coach. They're probably sitting in there as we talked, as we saw coach Rabes, uh, talk in post game, but they're probably sitting in there trying to fix it, trying to figure it out. But you know, I, I took a couple screenshots and some, sh- I could show you some stuff, but Derek Henry continues to run downhill into these eight and nine man boxes with nothing but mud. You can't see anything. Yeah. And we, you know, uh, we can get into this more again, but we started off the game First, first play from scrimmage in 11 personnel and spread. And there was the most beautiful, majestic six-man box you've ever seen. <laughs> and I mean, it was just, it was like, I, I swear I stopped it and framed it and just stared at it. You know, Six there was four people. down, yeah. yeah, four down linemen and two backers. And I thought, oh my goodness gravy, that is the most beautiful thing that Derrick Henry's ever seen. He goes and, and he fell forward for eight, I think it was, and he shouldn't have gotten tripped up, mm. but he might have been out the gate, and we never went back to it. We never went back to it until the third quarter. We go back. We uh, we broke off uh, Ty J Spears, who's been one of the biggest highlights mm. on offense this year, breaks off a 10, 12-yarder, and then Derek breaks off another 10-yarder, but we spread it out a little bit. And I think, for me, seeing play after play, I'll give you an example for Tennessee fans, okay? And we're going to talk Vols as well today. Yeah, coming up next even with Mark Heim of AL.com. Yeah, so what the Tennessee – this is for Tennessee Titans and Tennessee Vols fans. You're going to understand this analogy. And I know it's college to pro. Don't – you know, I, I understand that, and there's a huge difference. But the Tennessee Volunteers, they spread the formation basically mm-hmm. to, from sideline to sideline. And, I mean, Hypel will get up to the line of scrimmage – just to see what's going on and not even be ready to snap the ball, Mm -hmm. it's to make the defense declare what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The defense has to show you what they're doing. They are now having to guard – they're having to defend the field vertically Mm -hmm. and horizontally, and all it does is create space, so much space in between. these. It it declares your matchups. The receiver knows who's guarding him. The linemen know their targets, all this stuff. And not to mention – 
if you put 11 personnel on the field, which is one tight end, one running back, and th- three wide receivers, a little bit lighter package, mm-hmm. you got less run stuffers. So instead of putting Derrick Henry in these crammed boxes, I would love to see them implement some of that volunteer, the, the Tennessee Vol offense where we spread it out. Don't treat him like he's Eddie George or Jerome Bettis or Mike Allstott who's just going to blow a hole open. Spread it out and let him get into some green grass and some open field. That's when he's the most dangerous, and we just haven't done it. And I'm sitting there breaking down the film this morning again, and I'm just watching play after play after play of our heavy formations, or excuse me, heavy personnel groups, Mm -hmm. tight formations with tight splits, and all that does is compress everybody into the middle of the field, Mm -hmm. including the defense, and it just makes it a complete mess. If you're on the goal line, Mickey, and you're on the one-yard line, what formation are you running? You're tying it down. You're putting big butts out there, and you're going to try to run it at somebody because all you need is one to two yards. Right. Well, we're doing that on first and 10 on the 25-yard <laughs> line with, the, with a guy who should have been a perennial MVP candidate. I mean, it is so hard to watch him run the ball for one to two yards and get hit in the backfield. But nobody knows their targets. All the defensive linemen have to do is stunt or run a game or, or cross – interior on the on the in the a gap and it blows up everything because everything is so compressed if you go back and look at what what the the running plays that had success against the ravens you are going to see spread out and 11 or 12 personnel but spread out guys with that create space uh horizontally and i don't know why we can't get to that i don't know why we can't get back to that and it, it is for it is gotten frustrating to watch for a guy who Lives and dies by two tone blue every Sunday. You know what's crazy? And I don't know if you even remember this. You hung out with me probably four or five days total all of last season. We're blame us out. You came in and did the show and we were hanging out. Do you remember you said this same thing last year? Do it's, you remember this? I do. We remember. had a lengthy segment where you said, I have to bring something up. I want to talk about these tight splits. I I totally but, remember. So you have we've a, been watching this. So you have a different OC who was on the staff last year. Rabel, they all talk about we self scout, we self scout. So you had a whole off season to self scout, and a different guy calling the plays. Yeah, and they're doing the same thing that frustrated you. And for people who don't know, your your day job was wide receiver. You were a kick returner. So again, if you're new, you don't know who Mark is. This is an NFL veteran, seven year guy receiver talking. Is it strange to you that you would switch out the OC, self scout for a whole year? And then do a lot of the same stuff. Well, what's all? Yeah, I, I think it's it's outrageous, and that's why it's getting so frustrating. And I just I look at it, and I just you know I'll never get this opportunity, but I just want to say I want to ask Tim Kelly what is the what is the mindset there? What is the strategy? Why is it so tight? Because if it was tight like that, in my recollection of playing offense, now you have the outside the hashes all all wide open, right? You've compressed everything, so there's a lot of green grass. But ha- have you seen a ten yard out? thrown do we go run that speed out ever uh, no. so we don't take advantage of that green grass I'm they like, tried one time and Tannehill got hit as he was throwing well him. this goes back to the off yeah there's a lot of Tannehill getting hit and we got to give him his due credit for his toughness but I I, I mean I if you're going to self-scout and you're watching the last few weeks you need to go look at the run plays that have had success and I hate the it doesn't have to be uh, um, Derrick Henry taking the snap it doesn't have to be you know all this razzle dazzle, but when it ha- when you have had success, it's when you're moving and motion, and and you got you got um, Tajay Spears and Derek in the backfield at the same time, and you're faking, and you got the, giving the defense something to think about. When we st- when we get to the line of scrimmage and run vanilla inside outside zone, we get absolutely hammered. <laughs> and I mean, I'll tell you, I if you listen to me spew nonsense here for a while, you'll know that I love bringing this up. But Mike Malarkey said it in a way, and I don't know if you remember, but before D- Derrick Henry was here, DeMarco Murray was the uh, won the rushing title for and the And the AFC, he sure did. Yeah, so they knew how to, and, and what Mike Exotic Malarkey, smash mouth. The exotic smash mouth. <laughs> it is a physical style of football, but you are drawing up plays that you expect these runs to hit for big plays. Mm-hmm. There are There's no room in this offense, in our lack of consistent offense, for one and two yard rushes. We can't do it. We can't sustain it. We can't sustain drives. We're one of the worst team on the, in the league in third down and in red zone because we get behind the sticks because we have negative rushing plays over and over and over again. 
It's hard. It's hard to watch. And I mean, if you're I don't in think the group I'm chat, you feel any better. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, if you're in the group chat right now, or if you're on the phones, I need a little, I need a little positivity in my life because we're. I came on here looking for some for uh, for some optimism, and I'm spiraling here. Okay, okay. I'm spiraling. I need some help. Mark is spiraling. Oh, man. All right, we'll let him catch his breath. Mark Heim, AL.com. He covers the tide. Let's talk a little Tennessee, Alabama. Then we'll get back to some more Titan stuff. Uh, Mark will be hanging out all day for the Hitman today. You can join the discussion on the FNM Bank Chat after Mark is done. Mark Heim, that is. Mark Mariani's not going anywhere. You can jump on the phone, 615-737-1045. Maybe you've got something to say to help Moonshine cheer up. We'd love to hear it. But uh, Mark Heim is next.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Hit man off today, so we went to the offensive side of the ball. Mark Mariani, former Titan, sitting in for Blaine Bishop. Let's turn this uh, phone line down south and see what our guy Mark Heim is up to down in Alabama this week. Mark, how in the world are you, man? It's been a long time. How are you? Gentlemen, and I use that term loosely, uh, it has been a while. It must be the third weekend in October coming up. And I have to say, of course, offense always get called in for defense. It's the way of the world. That's right. Well, it's, the, it's the world we're living in these days. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's right. All right. Before we talk any football games, I have to ask you, let's get to the heart of everything that most people are concerned about. Where are you on this whole <laughs> Dixieland delight thing? Uh, I'm a fan of it. Yeah. Uh, a song but, written but in Tennessee, also, sung by a band from Alabama. Man, it's, caused, it's quite a custody battle. It, it really is. But you know what? To be fair, I'm a big fan of Rocky Top, too. We actually had this discussion on on our show this morning uh, because we have a guy that's a big Alabama guy on, on our board. He just refuses to play Rocky Top. I'm like, but, dude, it's it's really just a good song. Like, how do you not <laughs> like Rocky Top? Uh, so I, I think we're going to play a little uh, – Rocky Top, we're going to have Eli Goal on tomorrow on our show. I think we're playing Rocky Top for him, and then we're going to flip the tables and play um, Dixieland Delight for Mr. Uh, Kessler, who's joining us tomorrow as well. There you go, Mark. Uh, at Mark underscore Heim, AL.com, WNSP Radio. That's where you can find him. So we actually had somebody in the chat yesterday who asked us this question. We spent some time talking about it. Uh, we have this where if you're watching online, you can send us a message on you know Facebook or wherever you're watching and a guy asked us, who is the better quarterback, Jalen Milrow or Joe Milton? And I thought, ooh, I'm going to steal that, and I'm going <laughs> to ask this to Mark Heim tomorrow. Well, let's see. Uh, both have problems with some decision-making, clearly. Both have tremendous arms. One has problems throwing deep, right? The other one can't seem to, to hit the short and intermediate routes. <laughs> At this point, I think it's a toss-up. Uh, the question is, I guess, the better question is, who has the higher ceiling? Mm. Um I might go Milrow there just because of his youth, but the point is well made, right? Both have really struggled. Um, although I would I would assume that Milton had the higher expectation going into the season. Uh, Milrow was all athlete, and uh, but like Milton, he really struggles at times to to go through his progressions to make the right play, and then when he does make those right decisions, he, he's having trouble hitting that short guy and the intermediate guy. Uh, and with the short guy, it's not so much like like he just he just misses them. And sometimes he'll hit them in a way that he can catch it, catch it. But Mark, you could probably talk to this about getting it in a spot where you can get upfield and get those yak right. It'll really a probably kind of leaves them hang out to dry. So uh, I don't know if I have a question, an answer to that question. That's a long winded answer, a long winded non answer. But uh, I, I would think that both have played. Um, have not played to their expectations. I think that's a fair assessment. Mr. Captain Obvious moment there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we also gave a non-answer. Very yesterday. political answer yes. there. Well, on that same subject, Jalen Milrow started the year as quarterback. You guys did a little carousel thing. I fell guilty of doubting the Crimson Tide early in the year, and Nick Saban's tone was off. I felt like, you know what, this might be – the downhill slide, and so I uh, I went the other way and faded them a few times and and paid dearly for that. So what <laughs> what has what has Milrow done um, to to kind of alleviate the concerns at quarterback? And do they have complete faith in him now moving forward? And what are the keys for him to to getting the job done against the Vols this weekend? I think he's the lesser of three evils, quite frankly. Um, I, I think what happened was in the offseason, let's rewind a little bit, I, Nick Saban made it a point. He wanted to kind of get back to a more of a pro-style offense. So they bring in Tommy Reese from Notre Dame, and the talk was, you know, they were going to be a little more balanced, a little more pro-style in the running, and they want to eat up clock, right? He had gone the other way with Kiffin and Sarkeesian as the coordinators, and they went spread in, in zone reads and all this kind of stuff. But I think what happened with, with Nick was he was – he didn't want to get in a shooting. Uh, he didn't want to get in a shooting match with guys. He didn't want to have a track meet. So he wanted to eat up time. He wanted to eliminate the number of possessions the other team was having. And so he decided he wanted to go more pro style. So they bring in Tommy Reese, and of course they bring in Tyler Buckner. And then it it wasn't working. It, it clearly wasn't working. And so now you realize you realize the offensive line is nowhere near what they thought it was going to be. And in, in fact, probably the most disappointing part of this season has been Alabama's offensive line, especially after J.C. Latham, SEC Media Day, is talking about how they were going to be more physical and they were going to dominate people. Joke's on them. So 
fast forward, and Milro was kind of a, a, a square peg in a round hole, right? You're trying to run this pro style, like drop back, prototypical type stuff, and he's an athlete, right? He's more of the Jalen Hurts cloth, if you will. Like Jalen wanted, up, Jalen Hurts wanted up being a fantastic passer, but it wasn't until that final year at Alabama and then at Oklahoma until he developed that. Milro's a lot younger, uh, so it just didn't work. So they're like, well, this isn't working. Let's go to the more pro style guy. And Saban had been talking. This is where I think, guys, he did himself a disservice because he was talking about how competitive this quarterback competition was. Well, you saw what those guys looked like when they got in games. Clearly, it wasn't very competitive. Those guys were not very good. In fact, I would say they were atrocious. All right, so you go back to Milrow. He spins it as well. I told everybody they were going to play and they were all going to get a shot, but we really liked the way that Milrow responded to, to being benched and the leadership quality and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Truth of the matter is he gives them the best chance to win against a broken offensive line. Uh, now, the other issue I would add is he has not really taken off as much here recently as he has in the past with broken plays. And now people are starting to wonder. There were some rumors floating around social media about whether or not he was injured about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And Saban downplayed that and said he was healthy. But now we're trying to decide, is he really healthy or are they just really trying to make him that pocket passer that they always wanted? Mm-hmm. Hanging out with Mark Heim at Mark underscore Heim. You mentioned the Alabama offensive line. Is that offensive line ready for this onslaught of pass rushing that the Vols seem to be throwing at people week after week? Yeah, this this group is a Jekyll and Hyde group, man. Like they're like they they dominated. Like they were playing like championship caliber ball against Arkansas. Now, granted, it's Arkansas, but they've been in some dog fights. They they were in some really close games, as Saban indicated. But, man, the second half, it was like they decided they were going to take their ball and go home. Uh, pre-snap penalties were down, but, you know, penalties never come at a great time. But, man, some very inopportune penalties. Uh, penalties have been an issue for this team, not just this year, but all of last year. And I think that's why people started talking about Saban and the way uh, and whether or not his time has come, right? Because he, he, we couldn't get the simple things fixed, like jumping off sides. Like, how the hell do, does a team – False start on a victory formation play. That happened last week, guys. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I don't think anybody ever will. But to answer your question, I, I think if, if, if the right guys show up, they're, uh, they're up for it. We talked about Texas A&M's front seven and how dominant they were. Uh, Alabama couldn't run, but you saw that pass game come alive. Guys, if they can put it all together, like you could say that about any team, you've seen the brilliance in every aspect of the game. They just can't seem to put it all together for 60 minutes. Well, Vols are six in the country in rushing. Um, Up front, do you think Alabama has uh, has the Joes, the Jimmys and Joes, to to win the point of contact and to keep them? I think it's 230 yards a game average. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to me, as a receiver, you know, I'd like to see the – I'd like to see about 500 yards passing per game. (laughs) But that's not (laughs) what the Vols are doing this year. So – um, you know, where, where do you see, see the advantage? Do you think the advantage lies with the, with the balls there or can Alabama step up and stop that run? Uh, I definitely think it's advantage balls initially. Now, Alabama has been really good defensively, except for the men the, against Arkansas where everybody just kind of shut down. But when it time, it came time to bow up again, they, they, they took it out of KJ Jefferson's hand when they play, they're really good. So the question I have is, I think at some point, uh, I think Milton's going to have to prove that he can beat them with his arm. I think he's going to have to make some throws or else they're just going to, they're going to load up the box. I think Alabama has been up to the task. Um, you know, Dallas, Dallas Turner is a, is a, is a game changer. Deontay Lawson's kind of the next in that long line of middle linebackers that kind of the quarterback. They speak very highly of him. They, they have the dogs to do it. Now, is it going to be one of those deals where the Alabama offense is struggling? They, you know, it's three and out. You got to bring defense back on the field. You know, every every two and a half minutes. If so, I do think I do see a scenario where Tennessee could wear this defense down. I think if 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 Alabama could sustain some drives and get some scores and keep the pressure on Tennessee to score, um, I, I I think that'll that'll loom large for that for that group. Mark Heim, our guest at Mark underscore Heim, AL.com, writing and WNSP radio talking. Uh, what's the latest on the Tides injury front? Uh, I've seen some positive updates on Tresman Marshall. It looks like most things are good on him. But overall, what's going on? Uh, I think overall, with the exception of the, 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 the hypothetical, rhetorical, phantom potential injury of, uh, 
of Jalen Milrow that nobody seems to really want to talk about. Uh, I think all is uh, is good. I know um, the punter Burnip uh, was uh, was an issue. I think he's going to be okay. Uh, Malachi Moore is supposed to be back. That's going to be huge for the defense. He's he's a difference maker with that group. Uh, he was uh, he took the field and was I think in full uniform. Uh, did not appear to go through team drills though. Um, so uh, Terry on Arnold, who has played really well, mm-hmm. moved to Moore's usual star position. So. I think they're getting more back. Uh, he sustained that injury against A and M. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. I think that's pretty much it. Um, so I think they're in fairly good shape. Um, uh, Dow Court, the offensive lineman, and Ferguson were both dressed out during warmups last week. Um, so I think most of those guys will be good to go. How much, if any, how much revenge talk is there? amongst people in and around the program based on what happened here last year in Knoxville? Oh, I think, I think, I don't, I, I think they're using it for sure. I think it's more talk about from fans. I mean, as you guys know, it had been, it had been a minute since she beat Alabama. So uh, there was a little bit more uh, shock, I think more than anything last year, just because you have arguably the best player on offense in the country and Bryce Young and the best player on defense and Will Anderson and, and, and you lose a track meet. Uh, to a team that you just haven't lost to in forever. So I think it's very much uh, uh, an issue. I think I think the players, for the most part, are using it as fuel. And I, I think you're going to see a really fired up crowd at Bryant. Denny. Hanging out with Mark Heim at Mark underscore Heim, AL.com, WNSP Radio here on Blaine and Mickey. To me, Mark, it seems like, I don't know. I could be wrong here, but it seems like it's going to be a physical game. It's going to be in the trenches. There's going to. I think it's. It feels like it's going to be low scoring. Take the under. You're saying. Well, I, it's 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 more about the. I I think the winner of this game personally is whoever makes more big plays. I mean, Jalen Milrow, every time, at least personally, like I said, I've counted him out, and it's been painful for me. He seems to throw an absolute dime deep ball, and so in what situation are we? You know, are we looking at? that the Vols could gain that advantage. And two, are you, is that how Alabama fans feel? Is it kind of like nickel and dime, nickel and dime, and then go all out and, and take that big play? It just feels like that's what they've been doing. Even last week when Arkansas was gaining the momentum, felt like they were going to take control of that game. Milro hits them deep again, and it keeps happening over and over. The Ole Miss game, same thing. He beats you with his arm on that deep ball. What do the Vols have to do to stop that on Saturday? Yeah, I, well, a couple things. One, uh, you know, if the offensive line continues to have its troubles, I think Tennessee feasts, right? I think I think you can bring an extra guy, especially if he's not going to make the attempt to throw. And what's, what's bizarre is for most of the year, Alabama has really kind of struggled to find that, that number one at receiver, right? Jermaine Burton has obviously stepped up. It's, it's gotten to the point now where I feel like he's only looking for Burton. But typically you don't see more of a deep ball because I don't think he's got the time. I think when he has the time to set up and just let it rip, and it, it's exactly what it looks like. He just looks like he's just hauling off and throwing it, but for some magical reason, it lands right in a in the bread basket. He has an uncanny <laughs> it ability. It does. To do. I, it's perfect. It looks, so, it looks so awkward too. The throwing motion. I mean, I'm not a QB guy, but it just looks like there's like a little hitch, and he doesn't come all the way back. It's weird. Um, I mean, I ain't, I'm not hating, right? As long as he gets it done. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm with you. Uh, this to me feels more like a. 26 20 26 21 type game where you know be lucky or feel fortunate that you scored when you did because you're going to need every point um uh to your to, to your to your question though i mean if they if they implode i mean if you're starting some pre snaps penalties and these guys uh, this offensive line is really struggling which could very well be the case um you know I, I think alabama could be in for a for a long day with that with that front seven from tennessee where is this Bama team now, right now, today, as we're talking about it, compared to where you thought it would be or who you thought it was before the season? Because there were people who said, they're done, this is over. And I we had uh, Tony Barnhart and other people said, oh, no, I think Alabama's going to win the, the whole thing this year. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, well, first of all, the, quarter, the guy that's playing quarterback was not even – I think everybody just assumed that Tyler Buckner was going to be the guy. Mm. And so I thought people, I think people thought it was going to be back in those kind of Jake Coker years, um, even AJ McCarron years where you just got a guy sitting back there and picking people apart and, 
and, and you know, you go up to play action and you're, and you're running old school Alabama. And it just kind of hasn't been that way. I think Tommy Reese is kind of, instead of, instead of kind of catering Jalen Milrow to the Alabama offense, I think finally they've gotten the message that, you know what, the hell with it. Let's just scrap it. Let's, let's cater that offense to his strengths. And so you're starting to see um, um, some different play calling there, which I think has alleviated some of that. I think most people thought the defense was going to be pretty good. Um, now, I'll tell you, Kool-Aid McKinstry has been a guy that I think most people thought was just going to be a stud this year. He's been great on the back half of this. If he can ever field a clean punt and get some room to go, he's a threat. The problem is he's, he's really had an issue just handling the punt. Uh, he's dropped a couple of them. They've, they've been fortunate enough to recover them or they've gone out of bounds or whatever. Um, but, yeah, the offense is much different than I think most people thought it was going to be. I don't think anybody thought the offensive line was going to be an issue. Um, I, I think most people thought this team was going to contend, which is crazy, guys, because as, as, as bad as they've been and inconsistent as they've been, they still have all their goals right in front of them. Yeah. Um, the same ones that they had in the preseason. And if you had told me in the preseason they had all these issues, I I'd I'd, I'd figured you all were, were, you know, three deep into the moonshine. Uh, tell me that. <laughs> that hey, just real quickly on the way out, you think Congress is about to solve everything for college football? You covered this sport for a minute now. Congress about to nail all this down? Well, they can't make it work. Oh, wait, maybe they can't. I don't know, man. I've always been a, <laughs> nice. I've always said, man, they got to be more important things going on in the world. Like, yeah. I, I don't, we don't talk politics, but I just I can't imagine that we're paying people in the NCAA, whoever these people are, all this money, like figure it out. Like I just it, like if you and I went to some other entity to help us do our job, then it seems to me we wouldn't be we wouldn't be getting paid because obviously we couldn't do our job. But I, I don't like when when Congress gets involved with anything sports related, whether it's NIL or you know college football playoff or EA Sports or whatever. But <laughs> it's kind of the world we live in, guys. It sure is. Mark, great stuff, man. Uh, AL.com, WNSP Radio, at Mark underscore Heim on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Great uh, great catching up with you, buddy. Enjoy the game on Saturday. Yeah, enjoyed it. You guys, too. Thanks. Yes, sir. All right, Mark got into this. He was talking about punt returners. The guy sitting across from me was a pretty good punt returner. And uh, the Titans are having some trouble at punt returner. Let's talk about punt returning next. Did you know Eurofix has a very different business philosophy? They staff all their locations with more staff than the average auto repair shop, just so they can be ready for when your emergency pops up out of nowhere. And have you ever noticed how hard it is to get in a right now appointment for your vehicle repair? Well, some dealers can be more than two weeks out just to get a freaking appointment, but not a Eurofix. Eurofix has been offering quality repairs that beat the dealer without the dealer pricing since 1999. Plus, they have a three-year nationwide warranty and the staff to fix your car right away. I mean, like right now. So if you're tired of waiting forever to get your car into the shop, then call Eurofix. Owner Aaron Stokes says, we will never be too busy for our customers. We're here to take their pain away, and we mean absolutely right now. And Eurofix repairs all European cars. So Eurofix says yes to speedy repair when others can't or won't. Family owned for 24 years. If you want the best, just give them a call at 844-EUROFIX. That's right, 844-EUROFIX, or you can visit them online at myeurofix.com. That's myeurofix.com. But I always tell them Blaine to you.
40 years ago, we opened our doors with one mission in mind. We'll be right back with the top 10 songs of 1983. To sell quality American-made vehicles at a fair price. You have arrived. And we've loved every minute of the ride. Celebrating 40 years of Two Rivers Ford. Blaine and Mickey, special guest, Mark Mariani. What we got, we got to give it to you until 3 o'clock anyway, and then 3HL will get you the rest of the way home today. You do a little dance, and you drink a little water, and maybe you muff a pint uh, if you're Kyle Phillips, who went back into the game, and he, well, first of all, Mark Mariani's hanging out for Blaine, and Mark uh, was a punt returner, kick returner, wide receiver by trade. They were punting, I believe, from the Titans 46, talking about the Ravens. And there were, I believe, 11 seconds left when the ball was snapped. So if a guy's punting from you, it's not like he was punting from his own five, and you're like the Vols last week, you're like, oh, we're about to take this thing to the house. Yeah. This, guy, uh, this is an opportunity. This is not an opportunity to do anything. First of all, as a guy who made a living in the NFL playing a lot of special teams, why not just put 11 people on the line of scrimmage and just try to block it? And then not even have anybody back there. What are you going to do if you catch the ball on the four yard line with three seconds left? I think multiple. One. I think multiple things at play here. I, the execution, obviously, we can talk about, but this is a coaching error right okay. here. I mean, I don't know, you know, whose job it might be to 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 get in his ear 
Um, but there's no reason he should have been feeling that punt. And it's not like one of those specific things that you practice every week. Hey, right before half, you know, it, but you've done it before. Um, and it should have clicked that the half's over. And right. I mean, to give that up, to give them three points at the end of half was just a massive turn of events. I thought our defense was playing so well. Uh, but yeah, I think Ackerman or the assistant special teams coach or headman, whoever is in that is in Kyle Phillips ear for me back in the good old days, it was coach Watterson. We would measure out the distance between, you know, Hey, we're standing 45 or 50 today and whatever we would chat about strategy and whatever. Someone's got to tell him to get away from that ball. And so I, I don't know if it's coaching or what, but it was just a terrible execution on a play that he shouldn't even been in the area. So that it was, those are such valuable points that you put on the board. And after our defense got put in another terrible situation and got us out. So that it was just, it was painful. Um, so yeah, I think I, you know, you don't, I don't want to sit here and place blame, but I think it should go around evenly. I mean, coaching should have been there and Kyle should know that that's a ball we don't need. There's no point in taking that ball right there. It's the end of the half. And to have it end the way it did was a huge critical turning point in the game, I think. And you're in such a box. Again, it's not like he was punting from his own 20. And, and there's a chance, oh, he may outkick his coverage with this, and I may get loose. Everybody no. was in the same no, 25 not. yards of each other. That's a plus That's a plus field kick. It's an end over end. That ball's hanging up there. That's 99 times out of 100. That's a fair catch, or you're letting it bounce in yes. the, into the end zone. So there's no return possibility on that it it, it and, and as the ball was coming in over and down you could tell I mean now we can talk a little bit about technique because truthfully I watched it over and over to try to figure out what's going on and I think it was just a hundred percent lack of focus he was there he was square his elbows were together just like they teach and he just took his eyes off the ball and let it bounce high off his chest and couldn't corral it and the frustrating part um about watching that and about seeing where we're at with Kyle Phillips is that I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of hype has gone on around him mm -hmm. coming out as a rookie and as a second year guy. Now um, he's done so much in the preseason. He's done it at practice. We've seen him, you know, breaking off DBs in practice and doing these things. And it feels like that we've had a moment or two on Sundays dur during the game, but it really feels like we haven't seen, him him performing crunch time and, and how many punts has he put on the ground now i think it's three or four and this is he's played six games mark and is Same it two four years or three four last year and two this year but is it i think he's already muffed three or four balls uh, yeah it, somebody was tweeting it out, out earlier and i read it obviously everything you hear, hear on twitter is is, is factual 100 <laughs> yeah, percent. everyone but, knows that but now i you know i don't want to go too negative and start grilling the guy but at some point Mickey, at some point you got to turn the corner and you got to start your development as a player. We it, it, practice is one thing, you got to take it out on the field on Sunday, and it was just a total lack of focus. And my issue with it is it's consistent now. You do it almost every time you're on the field. If you have played in six games and you've muffed three balls already, yeah. it's at least three. It might be four. I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll go look up the stats. But that means fifty percent of the games you play and you put a ball on the ground. So why are we continue to put him back there? Kyrus Jackson, I thought, was doing a really great job. So now we're just going to keep handing the ball to Kyle Phillips. I like him. I want him to succeed. I've seen him do it in practice. But at some point, this is, an, this is another problem, another issue we're having that we've got another hour to talk about. But at some point, these young guys have to continue their development. These second-year guys, these third-year guys have to continue development. This is a huge concern and a huge red flag for me because – this goes back, I think, to well, drafting, obviously, but then coaching. If you're under if you're in the building getting coached by these guys and you're not continuing to progress, continuing to develop, start making plays on a more consistent basis, then what you don't have a future here. You don't have a future here. So why are we continuing to throw him out there if he's gonna do it? And he's been an absolute non factor on the field as a receiver. So where is this guy? And we keep trying to get him reps. I'm struggling to see it, and you make a play. As a guy who was always a you know, 50, 51, 52 spot roster guy on, on the roster, I know that those type of plays will get you cut. Those game-changing plays will get you cut. 
putting a ball on the ground and give, handing the team three points will get you cut. Yeah. If that was a free agent guy and we don't have draft capital invested in him, if that was a Mason Kinsey type, he might not have been sent out there in the second half to return a punt. So I don't know why we keep w- w- this, how, how long we're going to go with this experiment. But to me, he's got the athleticism. He was in the right place. He, he, he had the right technique from what it looked like to me. And it was just a complete lack of focus. And it's the third or fourth time in six games. So it's, it's continuing. It's consistent. And I just, I, I don't know how long we're going to continue this experiment. Let's pick this up on the other side because we're up against the top of the hour. So if not him and Jackson is not available in the immediate time frame, maybe where's the best place to turn? Let's get into that on the other side. Is it Mason Kinsey? Is it somebody else? Do you try to find somebody on waivers? Did Mark has his cleats in his trunk. Do we try to make that happen? I don't know. We'll get into all of that and more in hour number two. You wanted to uh, join the discussion, you can. 615-737-1045. Jordan DeJani will also join us uh, in hour number two in about 25 minutes to talk all things NFL. We'll be right back. You know what would be awesome today or this weekend or any time the weather's nice, the summer, the fall, the spring? There's no bad time to be at the lake. And if you've been dreaming of your own opportunity to have lake property, well, here's your shot. And it's coming up soon, Saturday, October 28th, for the first time ever experience lake living at a fraction of the price. Two-acre wooded lots from 64 k lake villa packages from 349 so under 350 to get out there. Last remaining sunset waterfront lots 50k off. And this is the good stuff. This is the true lake living experience, but all the modern stuff you want. Walking trails and shoreline and clubhouse and waterfront concerts and pickleball and everything else that you've been dreaming about. And it's all about 20 minutes from Knoxville and financing is available. So why not call now, secure an appointment and go check this out and make your lake dreams come true. Again, limited property release Saturday, October 28th. You can visit us and get more info now at lakelivingtn.com or better yet, call now 865-408-9992. Invest in something real, Lake Living.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone, hanging out with Mark Miriani today, the hitman with a well-earned day off. So we ended hour number one. If, you, if you're new to Nashville, maybe you're an alien, you just landed on Earth, you missed the the NFL career of Mark Mariani. It's a couple of years in the rearview mirror. You're not old, but it's a couple of years in the rearview mirror. Don't remind me, bro. So we were talking about the punt return uh, opportunity that the Titans chose to, for some reason, try to take at the end of the first half against the Ravens. We all know what happened. The ball was fumbled and recovered with one second left. The Ravens came out in a game uh, that could have easily been tilted by a play like that. The game was tilted. They got three free points. Uh, and, and otherwise, well, that was a momentum shift. It seemed like the Titans had gotten the momentum back in the game that handed the momentum back to the Ravens, uh, and the Titans had to try to fight it back. But anyway, that was certainly a three-point swing that they could ill afford to give away. So we got into, with Mark, the decision made to send a punt returner back there and what went into him not catching the ball. You can catch it all later. You can catch hour number one and hour number two anywhere that you catch your favorite podcast. Um, but if not Kyle Phillips, because Mike Rabel was asked about it, you know, you kept sending him out there in this game. It goes, well, it's not like we have other people. We had yeah. a money hooker who's technically the backup and he had a cast on his hand. Uh, a money hooker has a concussion history. That's the last person I want back there. No, kid. you know who you need back there is like a skinny little Seventh round draft pick from Montana who's got a couple of screws loose. Are there because, any of those guys available right because, now? Because that's truly one of the strengths of my uh, that of, of my game was every year, you know, when the when training camp came, there was a faster, quicker, more explosive guy that would come to compete for the return job. And the truth of the matter is they're really, really hard to catch. It's one of the most intense things that I've ever done. You're standing under a punt. You're hearing the guys in front of you, you know, crashing pads, and you're hearing guys huffing and puffing, and there's 240-pound linebackers coming downhill who are paid to smack you, and it's a hard thing to do. The bottom line is, as a returner, the number one primary thing. I know this one. Yeah. The number one most mandatory priority is to give the ball to the offense in any means necessary. So – I've been on teams where we were atrocious in the punt return game and we couldn't block anybody. So what do you do? You go out there and you fair catch the ball because that's the least of of two evils and you don't turn the ball over and make a game-changing play on punt return. We want to get the ball in our offense's hands. That's the number one goal as a returner. Then you get to get the first first down and then you get to make an explosive play. You don't get to do any of that unless you secure the ball. And so... As a return man, it makes me cringe watching such a big play in a close game come down to a muff punt on a play that didn't matter. Yeah. So where do you find the answer? I don't know. I don't know who on the roster could do it. I don't want to see Amani Hooker back there. I don't want to see one of our, uh, you know, we used to have, you know, a guy like um, uh, Adore Jackson came in to punt return. Well, we need a guy like that to be a lockdown corner. We don't need him back there getting hurt on a punt return and those type of situations. So that's why they threw me back there. And that's Mm -hmm. why, that's why, you know, guys and guys in the return game, you know that that's a very physical play and that you might get dinged at whatever it is, but you have to secure the football. So I think maybe the mentality just has to change. We need to we need to be more conservative. We're not trying to set up times time. though where they just said uh, last year was Robert Woods who was argue, yeah. who was their number one. He was. This is not arguably. He was their number one receiver, and they're like, "Hey, go catch these punts." That's it. Go catch them and and fair catch them and don't take any risks. I mean, guys do, have done it for years. Edelman used to do it back in the day when he was still the number one guy. But you don't want to take risk and do that thing. I mean, I'm. This was a game changing play. Obviously, you know what else was a game changing play giving up a 60, 70 yard punt return the 70. other way. And I think we did that against the um we gave up another one this year. Who was it against? Um I'm trying to remember. I'll look oh, it up. Oh, they've had trouble covering punts. Yes. And Stonehouse then went a couple of games where he was just punting it like current. He was punting directional. You cannot well, this was you was gotta be making game changing plays in the positive, not in the negative when you're in the special teams. And that's and that's a problem. We have a problem right now with every with people whether it's from the O-line on down, taking their turn, making mistakes, and making impact on the game in a negative aspect. So, anyway, as the return man, 
you got to secure the football. And so what do you do to do that? I don't know. Get back to fundamentals. But I think this was just a total lack of focus. You weren't getting hit on this play. He knew he wasn't getting hit. Mm -hmm. When it's really intense is when you know you're getting hit. <laughs> that's, that's the hard one. Well, you told me, too, and I'd never thought about this. I I mean, I've returned punts on the playground, but never in games. You said, and tell me if I'm right, you would find the ball, then look and you looked, you could look at everybody and then find the ball. Is that right? Or the, was it the opposite? opposite. You never Those, looked. Yeah. You looked at everybody, and then once you found the ball, you never looked back at everybody again. I tried to learn that, and I... I had a hard time, and I, I know a lot of the young guys are doing that now. For me, I was locked in laser on that football. Okay. And I used preparation, and I used my other senses, like listening, and also, you know, you get a you get a, um, a stopwatch in your head going. How long was the hang time? How far was the kick? Did it turn over? Where's my double team? You know, did he put the ball where he wanted to? You, you could do a lot with your pregame uh, in, in your prep work to know if you had a chance to return it. Do we even have a return called right now would be a good one. You know, and then you rely on the 10 guys in front of you. But I, this might be an issue. I, I got to go back and look at the film. But a lot of guys find the ball, get to the spot, and then look down at the rush to see what's happening. That is a total lack of focus to me. And that is not the technique I would be coaching if I was coaching guys because yeah. – it, it it leads to major errors, and these it, when you do that on a on a as a returner when you turn the ball over, that's a huge play, man. That always is a huge play. So I couldn't do it. I didn't like doing it, um, and I don't think they're teaching that. A lot of young guys are doing that. I just I think it. I think we got to hammer our our punt returner, or kick returner, or or Kyle or whoever we're gonna throw. Out there, just say, we got to focus, man. We got to focus. It's 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 getting to be an issue that he's putting the ball on the ground. And Frank, would you put him out there again if it were you by choice? You got two weeks. If maybe Kiaris Jackson isn't back, would you tell Kenzie, "Hey man, we're gonna get you ready to go, make you active." Oh man, it's so hard. I I, I performance wise, no, I I couldn't put him back out there. Guys lose their jobs for this. Yeah. But looking at our roster. I think you have to, and I think you just got to tell them we're fair catching things. We're not going for the return. Yeah, get he, it out of your head. Ugh. I mean, dude, get it out of your head because here's the other thing. Ah, oh, man, so hard. I, I, I don't want to be so negative on a young player, but he's it, he's he's not adding a ton in in the offensive side of the ball. We haven't seen him. Has he made a catch? I think he's made one catch. I think he's made one. And it's funny, Mark, because, and again, we're talking about Kyle Phillips. Last year, we all talked about him so much after training camp. Then he went out there, played the first game, and he had that nice punt return. Then he got hurt, slammed out of bounds, and then it all kind of spiraled down from that. He only played four games. Yep. So this year, we all come back for training camp again. And I remember saying his name on the show and this chat where people can respond to us. I told Blaine, people are vicious about this guy. Like, you guys shut up talking about him. He doesn't do anything. Yeah. Like, and, and all I can say is I watched him practice every day. And saw people struggle. His short area quickness is so different than anybody else that they have. Yeah. He's a different cat. And then if you watched his punt return videos coming out of college, and I know it's different. Yeah. But his punt, it was like a Dory. His return game was like porn coming out of college. But I will tell people till the day I die, your stats were identical to his when you were both on the same team. So you as a pro had equal stats to him as a return man. You did. But they finally said, we have to put Mark out there because it's a guy we can trust. I just don't know if Kieris isn't back. Maybe he's, I don't know what his status is. Nobody's brought him up in a while. Yeah. I don't know if you don't have to just tell Kenzie, like, we're going to pull you up to the roster. You don't even have to play wide receiver. We'll just have you return punts. I know it's a luxury, but. Oh, man, it's hard for me. It's Here's what here's what else has been hard to watch for me. And and I, I, I'm going back to maybe a Delaney Walker type guy who was that third down guy, but he was an every down player. So that's not fair. But the, the stereotypical Wes Welker, Brandon Stokely, um, Edelman type of slot receiver that comes in on third down and move the chains. Like I, I was a little bit at, in Chicago. Um, we, there, there's not that many teams that have that defined role anymore where you're just coming in in 11 personnel and you're pretty much, 
a matchup nightmare for somebody and you're going to move the chains. I don't know that many teams because that that those those roles are really not there. And I, I can't think of a good example in the NFL right now of a receiver who's very, a third down guy only who comes in in the slot and works the middle of the field. So so then you go to the next phase of this is, okay, he's not, if he's not out there for a turner, what is he giving you on offense? What is he giving you? And if it's nothing, we got to just look elsewhere. And I really... I really liked Kyrus Jackson's decision making. I thought he made some really good plays. I thought he I thought he handled a couple balls that were on the ground really well. When a ball is rolling and hits in front of you, that's a tough spot to be oh, in. He, yeah. And and he handled a couple of them early in the year really well. I know he's hurt, but that's a hard decision, man. I I don't know that you bail on Kyle Phillips yet, but I do think that a, a, a serious conversation to be had. We can't take any more risks, dude. You got three on the ground already in your career, man. That's not a good number. And I think it's just a lack of focus. Oh, if you can't, uh, here's, here, uh, here's Teron Davenport. I just did a quick look. I believe Kyrus Jackson will be eligible to get the designation to return from IR after the bye week. I, I think he's just looking at it time-wise based on when he went on IR. Um, have to wonder if they consider going back to him at punt returner. Yeah, I'm just looking to see if there's any news. There's not any news on him. Just that he might be back or when he might be back. But um, it'll be interesting to follow because we have seen this team for long stretches just tell a veteran guy to go back there and catch the ball and just hand it to the official who will then hand it, you know, to the, the official who will spot it and then away you'll go. But it scares me when you say, because... I never even played, but I know, like, there's no return. There's nothing you can do. There's just let the ball go. And you're telling me Phillips had everything. His arms were locked, his elbows together, everything he was taught to do. And he lost concentration. That terrifies me. I watched it in slow-mo over and over. It was an end-over-end kick, which is are, they come down the slowest, and then they come down um, very consistent. You know what they're doing. They don't move around a lot. And so... It's the only re- it's the only thing, dude. You just it just didn't execute, man. And it's showing up over and over and over on this football team. And I know, like we we talked about earlier and we talked we looked at the coach Vrabel clip of kind of a defeated head coach behind the microphone talking about how he can correct this stuff. It's execution, man. Yeah. And everybody's taking their turn. And guess what else is gonna happen? Here's what happened to us in Chicago. We had a guy named Pat O'Donnell. Pat could boom the ball. Well, you know what sucks? If you can if you got a punter that can boom the ball, but you don't get you don't can't cover it. If you can't cover it, why are you gonna boom it? <laughs> yeah. So so we're gonna be looking at special teams going, you can't be making these game changes, game changing plays for the negative. Yeah. We gotta turn we gotta make this a, an advantage for us or else we're gonna have to pull the dogs off. We're gonna have to say, hey, punt it out of bounds, punt it forty five yards straight up. Yeah. You know, fair catch everything. Like don't the Chargers take the punter ball. who just kicks it straight up every time. Yeah, don't yeah. take the ball out of the end zone, all that stuff. I've been on teams like this. It's terrible. But, but if you guys can't execute and you're gonna get penalties and you're gonna uh, not cover kicks and you're gonna change the game, we pl- we don't have the, uh, uh, enough of a football team to be able to make those mistakes and continue to absorb those plays, absorb those plays. Our defense got put in terrible situations on Sunday morning over and over and over the, again because of negative plays, and they can't keep absorbing those over and over. Yeah. Well, let's absorb some Jordan DeJani. He'll join us next. We'll get his NFL knowledge. Maybe we'll ask him who should be the punt returner. He might say Mark Mariani. Mark will be here with us for the rest of the day. We got about 45 minutes left of this extravaganza, and Jordan DeJani will join us next. Let's talk to all you folks out there who are dealing with hair loss. Ladies and gentlemen, why are you still dealing with it? Why in the world would you do that? You don't have to. You could call PAI. They've been in business for years, and they've been waiting on your call, well, for as long as you've needed to call them. But they can't help you if you don't call. 
You can hit them up at WeGrowHair.com also. And here's what you'll see there. Real people and real results. Real people who've tried uh, all the different therapy options that they offer and exactly how each one of those works because it's not a one-size-fits-all. And they match the right person up with the right plan. And guess what? Bingo. You've got your hair again. It's 2023. You don't have to live with a shaved head or a hat on all the time. You don't have to do it. Why not get your hair back? This is just craziness. Again, WeGrowHair.com, the best in the business. Over 26 years, they'll come up with a game plan and coach you through all of this stuff. They'll even give you a free consultation right now if you call. Permanent natural results from the company you can trust, PAI Medical Group, WeGrowHair.com. Don't wait. Call today, 615-376-6010.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone, giving it to you. I know. With Mark Mariani hanging out for the hitman today. <laughs> Jordan Dejani zooming into this experience. Jordan, say hello to Mark Mariani. Gentlemen, what's going on? How are you guys doing today? We're doing great. What's up? What's up? What's going on, guys? <laughs> See, since the hitman was out, I, I I needed another Titan talk to to bounce my ideas off of. So, you know, from one pro bowler to another, I get to return, man. I get to wide receivers. So, uh, you know, anything you need to know about punt returns and stuff, here's your resource, Jordan. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm glad you got someone who has some experience with the offensive side of the ball <laughs> in studio because that's certainly been a struggle for the Tennessee Titans early on. Uh, t- wow. You know what, man? We were trying to climb out of our little hole here. We've been pessimistic and negative all day. I don't think we, we fixed start- anything. <laughs> we were starting to get a little more positivity. It's better. And here we go again. Yeah, it's been brutal to watch. I hope you have to break down all that film over and over and over <laughs> of our explosive Tennessee Titans offense. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you guys were expecting a delivery uh, of optimism to your radio show. I'm certainly not the guy for it. Uh, unfortunately, Baltimore, excuse me, London was a disaster. You know, previewing that game with you guys this time last week, I told you that Tennessee's defense was going to have to rebound from their poor showing against the Indianapolis Colts. And then the offense was going to have to have its best showing of the season. And of course, that did not happen. So now here we are. Wednesday, October 18th, we're sitting at two and four last place in the AFC South. Where do we go from here, guys? I think Axel Rose once asked that. Where do we go now? Uh, and I don't know if he ever found his answer. Uh, I think he may still be looking. But let me ask you this. So we don't know how bad Ryan Tannehill's injury is. Mike Vrabel, I guess, alluded to what was similar to his first ankle injury last year where he didn't miss as much time as the second one, which took him out. And all the Pelicero's of the world and Jeremy Fowler's are reporting about it. It's sort of the similar thing, like maybe he'll miss some time, but maybe he won't. And, I mean, we all saw this movie last year. We feel like maybe he's going to miss some time. Who in the world should be the quarterback when the Titans play the uh, well, Atlanta Tennessee Foul Titans? Um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, let me tell you, I think that, you know, I'm a little worried about this injury. According to the reports, he's not going to need surgery. But the fact that Tannehill took himself out of the game and he noticed that he couldn't plant forward in his throwing motion when he threw that interception down the field. Yeah. Um, you know, we all know that Tannehill's a tough son of a gun. So the fact that he took himself out of the game and had to get carded to the locker room certainly says something. And even though we have the bye week this week to rest up, I don't think it's going to do that much. I think Tannehill is going to miss some time. Now, how much time, obviously, that remains to be determined. But now, for where do the Titans go with the quarterback position, I, I think a lot of people realize that Tan Hill's probably on the way out. It's, it doesn't seem very likely that he's going to re-up with Tennessee this offseason. So the Titans, between now and the offseason, have to figure out what they have in their two young quarterbacks. They don't have one young quarterback. They have two. So is Malik Willis going to start the remainder of the games and we're going to see what this dual threat weapon is capable of. But at the same time, we have this guy, Will Levis, who was objectively a better prospect coming out of college, the higher draft pick. Um, You want to see what he's capable of as well. And me personally, you know, I've watched a lot more of Malik Willis in the NFL compared to Will Levis. And again, I think Levis was the better prospect. So I'm kind of curious what the kid out of Kentucky may be capable of. But again, this all hinges on how he's been developing behind the scenes, how comfortable the coaching staff is with uh, trotting him out on the field. But I'm leaning towards Will Levis, depending on what the coaching staff thinks about him. Jordan Dejani, our guest, CBS Sports is where he writes things about stuff and more. For years, Jordan, we've said, okay, yeah, we're two and four, and, you know, we can, we can, if all, all we have to do is just win a couple, we'll get back to 500. At least we're in the AFC South. At least we're, we can still win our division. But I'm looking at that now, and I'm going, ish. So how good are the Jacksonville Jaguars? <laughs> That's analysis. I don't get a I don't I don't break down all the Jacksonville stuff. I watch all the games. They look really good. How good are they from your perspective? And is that feeling of like, hey, at least we can still compete in the AFC South? I mean, should we just be throwing that out there out the window? Yeah, I still think the AFC South is very much up for grabs and the Jaguars have won what three straight games now sitting at four and two first place in one of the worst divisions in the league but it's a great question because I'm still trying to figure out how good the Jaguars are as well right we've seen some um 
progress in terms of the offensive side of the ball. I think Travis Etienne just became the first Jaguar to record two touchdowns from scrimmage in consecutive games since Maurice Jones drew in 2009. The offense has taken steps forward. There's no doubt about it. Defensively, they've been a so much of a mixed bag. I mean, on one hand, they forced 15 turnovers this season, which I think ranks number one in the NFL. But at the same time, they have arguably the worst passing defense in the league as well. And the main question I had about this Jacksonville team coming into the season was that they lost more than they gained on the defensive side of the ball. So I was very curious to see if this defense was going to let the offense down because we all know that the Jaguars offense has potential with Trevor Lawrence, Doug Peterson, Calvin Ridley, Christian Kirk, it goes on and on and on, but defensively they've been very inconsistent. So in the weeks moving forward, and again, the Jaguars have been a very important stretch of their season or their schedule, I should say coming up now, I'm interested to see if this offense is going to take off, but if the, if the defense can, um, hold up their end of the bargain, if you will, as well. So I just did a column for CBS Sports earlier this week looking at the contenders in the NFL and the pretenders in the NFL. Right now, I do not view the Jaguars as a legitimate contender for a Super Bowl, but I do view them as the best team in the AFC South through six weeks. So Jordan Ajani, our guest, you're saying then maybe don't get too salesy then uh, before the trade deadline? Yeah, that's a loaded question. I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it's only easy. Time we like right? to ask around it, here. <laughs> true. I mean, it's when it comes to the trade deadline, and you're, you know, it's easy for everybody to be like, okay, yeah, let's ship off Tannehill, let's ship off Derrick Henry, DeAndre Hopkins, Kevin Byard. But you have to realize that you know a lot of these deals that come at the trade deadline are selling. Um, they're, 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 you're selling weapons for pennies on the dollar. You're not going to get exactly this, the draft compensation you're probably hoping for. So is that going to be something that immediately benefits your team? And I know that Tennessee is definitely lacking in draft capital for 2024. So that's something to keep an eye on. But I think you have to strike a deal when it comes to um, selling off important pieces of your team, but also getting the compensation that you think they're worth. So, you know, knowing Mike Vrabel and, and the Titans organization, I have a hard time believing that they are going to be automatic sellers at the trade deadline, sell, sell, sell. I don't see the organization working like that. And like I said, I mean, you're working in the AFC South. The year is not lost right now, but it certainly hurts now that your starting quarterback is dealing with an injury that could cause him to miss multiple games. Yeah, Jordan DeJaney, he doesn't miss any games covering the NFL for CBS Sports. Jordan, to your point on on the quarterback situation, and then we'll start grilling you about other stuff, but to your point about the Malik Willis, um, Will Levis conversation, if you look at it, and we have a new GM who didn't draft Malik. You're looking at the future. You're talking about Tannehill probably won't be back, but we we invested a second rounder in Will and all these things. If Malik is not in your future plans and you have a GM who didn't draft this guy, why would we even continue to throw him out there if, he, if the performance isn't there, one, which we've already seen a sm- sample size of, we had we had a lack, such a lack of faith in him at the end of last season. We brought in a rocket, <laughs> we brought in a rocket scientist to try to get us to the playoffs. That's how much lack of faith we had. And then this year, we've seen what's happened. So if if he's not a part of the future, and he, so we don't get him those reps to, to to graduate on the next level, and the performance isn't there. Why would Will Levis not be the obvious answer to to be our quarterback if Tannehill can't go? Yeah, I'm kind of missing that rocket scientist right about now as well, right? No, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's interesting because I think that's a great point by you. You know, Brant Carthon was not somebody who scouted Malik Willis and traded up in the third round to grab him. I think the Titans traded up for him. Anyway, yeah, Rand Carthon didn't pick Malik Willis with one of his selections. But uh, when it comes to Will Levis, you know, there's been this weird conspiracy theory, I guess, floated around by fans on social media for the past few months, and that's if – if Tannehill was injured in the middle of a game, Malik Willis would replace him. But if Tannehill, let's say, suffered a pra- or an injury during practice, then it would be Will Levis who actually started the game from beginning to end. Mm. And that's why a lot of people are saying, you know, let's say people who don't follow the Titans are saying, oh, it's Malik Willis time. It's Malik Willis time. I'm saying, hold your horses here. I think there's a legitimate conversation to be had. But again, I think it all hinges on the progress that Will Levis has been making um, behind closed doors. And we, we saw Vrabel comment on some of his, um, his his progress, if you will. I think he said that he's more of a – he's a more confident player at this point in the schedule. But, you know, we, it really does remain to be seen what Vrabel and the coaching staff 
think about Will Levis as a prospective starter. But to your point, that's why I do believe that Will Levis is the better option right now. Okay, little known story, Jordan. You were young when this happened. When Mark Mariani was drafted by the Titans in the seventh round, he asked for an ownership stake in the team. <laughs> what he was granted, actually, was 0.67% of the gross profits of the Fazolis on Harding Pike, which he continues to collect today <laughs> nice. because that was the agreement. So Caleb cool. Williams has asked for part ownership from any team that drafts him. How nuts are we with this deal, especially when it leaks after he just got hammered last week? Nuts. Absolutely nuts. Yeah, it, terrible timing. That's a great point by you. And you know what? I can't even fault the kid for trying. And I can't fault his representation for trying at all. I totally get what he's going after. But no, I don't think this is possible at all. I mean, when it comes to owning a stake in a franchise as – a player, but as a rookie player who just got picked as well, I think we're entering some very dangerous territory if we're handing out ownership stakes to some of our prospects that are just joining a franchise. I, I really don't see this happening at all. I think it's absolutely a fascinating story, but no, I, I feel like that's not going to happen. Jordan Dejani, our guest uh, covering the NFL. Uh, who's the hottest seat for coaches? Dare I say, is it Bill Belichick right now? Because he's coming up on the record for the most losses by any coach in the NFL. Yeah, and that kind of speaks to his longevity at the same time, right? He's been yeah. in the game for a long time and had that opportunity to pick up some of those losses. But no, to your point, I do think that Bill Belichick probably has the hottest seat in the NFL right now, which again is absolutely insane to say. I mean, look at what the Patriots are doing on offense. It's absolutely non-existent. Um, I think that, you know, there's been some questions about the quarterback, Mac Jones. What is Bill Belichick going to be able to do to rebound with him? But what's fascinating about the Bill Belichick aspect, and I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but the athletic recently reported that Robert Kraft doesn't think like all of us do, right? We like to think that Bill Belichick, one of the best head coaches in NFL history, he deserves to go out on his own accord. Apparently Robert Kraft does not subscribe to that narrative and he's very open um, to potentially firing Bill Belichick midseason. So I think it's certainly something to keep an eye on, but he's not the only head coach in the NFL with his uh, fanny on fire. If you will, <laughs> I think that Matt Eberflus, I think Matt oh. Eberflus of the bears is another coach yeah. that we need to keep an eye on. I think we've been talking about him all year and his seat hasn't exactly gotten any colder, if you will. I feel like he's just kind of not long for the NFL as a lead man at this point. I think that he had great success with the Colts as a defensive coordinator, but as a lead man for the Chicago Bears, it's very it's very possible that this franchise starts over. Uh, another guy I'll bring up real quickly, Brandon Staley of the Los yes. Angeles Chargers, yes. the guy that continues to make very confusing decisions every single game day. The Chargers, there's no doubt that they are they're underwhelming, right? I mean, the offense – it, they have a lot of weapons there. Justin Herbert is considered by many to be one of the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL. Brandon Staley was brought in to fix the defensive side of the ball, and that has just not happened under his leadership. The Chargers defense has been one of the worst since he took over. So I feel like Brandon Staley is another guy who could be on the outs in 2024. Yeah, he continues to not come up with funky expletive hits like every single day. Jordan DeJani, our guest, hanging out with Mariani. It's Majani. You guys are a power couple. <laughs> nice. Nice. Nikki. <laughs> hey, on the flip side of that, you said you did a contender pretender article without saying the 49ers and the Philly or and Philly or KC, some of the juggernauts. Give me a contender, a sneaky contender that may have gotten over the hump and maybe actually be making some noise as we get later in the season. Yeah, I'll give you two. And the first one maybe is not that sneaky, but how about these Detroit Lions? Love right? Them. Sitting at five. Love them. Standing at 5-1, first in the NFC North, there was a lot of hype surrounding this franchise entering this season. And let me tell you, they've lived up for it, lived up to the hype. How is this for a stat? The Lions have gone 13-3 and since week nine of last season. Only the 49ers and Chiefs have better records since then. Uh, Jared Goss been on fire. David Montgomery has been rejuvenated, rushing the ball. Jameer Gibbs is due for a breakout soon. Amon Ross St. Brown's an elite wideout. Sam Laporta's the best rookie tight end in recent memory. Jamison Williams is a deep threat that defenses have to account for. And defensively, they've been solid as well. I feel like I've been hesitant to jump on the Lions bandwagon because of some of the injuries they suffered on defense, right? C.J. Gardner-Johnson, in my opinion, was one of the best pickups of free agency. 
and he already suffered an injury that may knock him out for the rest of the regular season. That has not held this defense back. Emmanuel Mosley, Tennessee legend, he mm. tore his ACL a couple weeks ago. I thought this was something that was going to hurt the Lions secondary. No, it hasn't hurt them just yet. The Lions seem like they are definitely a team um, that is not only going to make the postseason, but is very capable of making a run as well. Now, to answer your question, a more sneaky team, a team that I'm kind of high on, uh, just met the Tennessee Titans. That's the Baltimore Ravens. I, I feel like defensively, we're not talking about this club enough. I think they're number two in yards per game through six weeks. Roquan Smith is a bona fide stud. The secondary has been playing a lot better compared to last year. But on top of that, we have to remember that the Ravens are breaking in a new offense, right? And there's been some growing pains with this new offense through this first one third part of the season. I feel like the Ravens are a team that we should buy some stock in because it's very possible um, that Todd Munkin's offense could really hit their stride um, as we reach that midpoint of the regular season. I feel like the Ravens are a team that got off to a hot start in a very loaded AFC North, and they absolutely have the wherewithal to go all the way when it comes to winning that division. JD, fantastic stuff, man. Glad you got to come and hang out with Mary Annie, and we got to break some of this stuff down and uh, looking forward to next week already. Who knows what quarterback stuff we could be talking about for the Titans this time next week. I can't wait. Who knows, baby? Really appreciate you guys having me on the show. Thank you. Yes, You're the sir. man, Jordan. Spitting so, fire today. He loves it. Always does. All right, when we come back, I want to play a game with Mark Mariani called Who Is He Talking To? And What Does He Mean? I'll play some sound, and then I'll ask you those questions. It's coming up next. Just because summer is over, that doesn't necessarily mean your to-do list is. The Cool Ray team is here to help, and they'll waive the service fee if your visit requires a repair. So you're having a plumbing problem that's popped up out of nowhere? Their plumbing team has you covered. Have an electrical issue you've been putting off? The electrical team at Cool Ray can be there for you as well. And, of course, if you have an HVAC unit that's starting to struggle, they can repair that all while waiving the service fee. And you can still save up to $1,250 on brand new Timstar Home Comfort Systems. Plus, they boost a 10-year parts and labor warranty on new Timstar Home Comfort Systems. So schedule your next visit online at CoolRay.com. No phone call, no wait, no worries. You pick the date and time that works for you. That's CoolRay.com.
need to figure something out. We need to figure out the guys who, you know, going to fight. We need to figure out the guys who want to be, on, be out there. Um, not the guys that don't want to be out there. That's what, we want. That's what it need to be. We need to reevaluate our team and, you know, figure it out. That's the message. Let's figure it out who want to play football for the Titans. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Mark Mariani hanging out for Blaine today, doing a great job. Lots of fun discussion. Uh, lots of uh, Fazoli's discussion now in the f and Bank chat. Probably made them some money today. Uh, TN Berg points out 0.67% of profits for that location. Probably got Mark a $20 check every month. So we talked about Fazoli's. Big Jeff was talking about finding guys who want to play football for the Titans. Who's he talking to? Not a great Thing to have to be saying by the pillar of your defense and the leader on your team after six weeks. <laughs> I mean, six weeks. It's not great. Um, but I agree with him, man. And we just are in here talking about pros and cons and good and bad and all this stuff. And it, I think a lot of it comes down to just straight up execution and guys just uh, the want to and, and going out there and making plays and hitting people. It seems like a lot of guys on the football field waiting for someone else to make a play. And that was a big thing in a couple locker rooms I was in is don't wait yeah. for someone else to make the play. You go make the play. But he's not even questioning that. He's talking about he's talking about guys that don't want to be there. And it that's just six weeks in. Great time for a bye to be able to reset. But, you know, along with those comments and the comments from Coach Rabes <laughs> feeling seeming a little defeated and wondering about how do we correct this stuff. Not great vibes coming out of the locker room, and and hopefully this bye week helps get back on track with the mental part. And you know, I'm always I was always a believer in in the guys, you know, per per you know, potential. My butt, yeah, it's performance that counts. If you got a guy who's foaming at the mouth to get on the football field and he's going to go make plays, even though he isn't the higher draft pick or paid them more money, you put that guy on the field. Because that's the type of guys you need. That's the type of guys Jeffrey Simmons need to be playing around him because that's the kind of effort he leaves on the field. We need to get rid of those bonehead penalties, obviously. But Jeffrey Simmons leaves it on the field every game. I think he needs a couple other guys maybe on the other side of the ball to start doing the same. You mentioned what Mike Vrabel said. Mike Vrabel was asked, I think it was PK who asked, uh, are your issues correctable? I think, Joseph, we got that. Some things losing, frustrated with losing. Something's unable to be corrected. Given Probably what you have. Maybe well, we'll see, but not gonna stop trying. Not gonna stop um, trying to prepare them and, and teach them and fundamentals and execution. You know, there'll be some good plays in there, and you know, there'll be certainly ones in there that we have to eliminate uh, that, that, that are getting us beat. That audio courtesy of our friend Buck Rising. He got asked, you think some of these are not correctable? And he, and he basically said, yeah. And Mark, six games in. That's the head coach. Six games in, man. Hey. Like, just a win or two away from being back in the divisional race. But what what pains me, we started this show by me sulking in my <laughs> in my pessimism here. We have not fixed anything. For, I, <laughs> you said, please, it. please make Get me feel the, better. Get in the chat, please. Someone give me some positive. Because the hard part, is we're two and four, and we beat two pretty good football teams, if I'm honest. But the hard part is look, looking forward and looking at what we have on this roster and, and guys that are flying around. The good news, a little light, a little sh- glimmer of hope, is our defenses are can keep us in every game. Mm-hmm. The Colts pushed pushed us around a little bit, but our oh, defense yeah. will push will keep us in every game. But looking around at a two other two and four teams. They either have a young quarterback or they have some skill position guys to look forward to. All our our future, a bunch of our guys on, on that that we would call our our mainstays and that we have excited, you know, a ton of expectations for, old, you know, are older. They're they're getting to toward the end of their career. We got our one of our best pass rushers that's coming off an ACL. That's a scary situation. We got guys that are, you know, in the last year of their deals coming up. It's like all these things are starting to stack up. And it, and unfortunately, like we talked about. It's the it's the years of having brutal drafts yeah. that are starting to catch up with us, and that's why Coach Raves is just sitting up there going, "I can only do so much, man. I, I we've we've out co- we've we've outperformed our our roster for years, and it, it seems like it's biting us. And you know, like I said, it's hump day. I'm sulking over here. Maybe <laughs> maybe maybe in ten days I'll feel a little bit better and and get off this. But it's it's hard to look at the roster and go, you know. 
get really excited. I mean, we can't haven't seen Traylon come through this year yet. Uh, I'm wondering where Chig Conquo is, you know, in his in his development. There's tons of guys that, you know, is Christian Fulton the answer or is he going to be gone as well? I mean, he got called out two games ago, yeah. dumb penalties. So all these things start stacking up. Again, all very negative. I need a little <laughs> help here, Mickey. That's Nick's, what I need. Nick I asked Folk you for is this. super good. I asked you for this. No, Nick Folk's the man, dude. I mean, he's they got since, that right at the that might 11th have been the, hour. That might have been the best seventh round uh, uh, transaction we've done since 2010, man. <laughs> Getting him for a seventh round pick. I mean, goodness gracious. What happened in 2010 with that pick? I forget. I don't know. Boy, that, Fazoli's owner from Montana stepped into this town, and <laughs> Nashville's Fizzoli. never been the same. Oh, my gosh. By the All way, right. your boys were on TV. They were showing a replay of Montana and Idaho. It was not a replay. It was last night. That happened live last night? Oh, no. That was Saturday night. Yeah. They, that was on a replay. Oh, dude. The 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 Stein is the trophy, and we beat them 23-21. It was unbelievable. Did you play in the Kibbe Dome ever? I never did. No, they weren't in our uh, conference back then. They basically play in a giant culvert oh, I, in the I, side I've of a hill. It. Yeah, it's It has it's a football awful. field. Unroll, they roll it it's out. It's so bad. It's <laughs> you so never bad. got to play in there? Yeah, I didn't have the privilege, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I've played in some other very interesting Big Sky Conference uh, stadiums and arenas, but no, not that one. You guys have. <laughs> it was. So you guys, good. and I know where our music's about to start playing. You guys have a fantastic spot in the world, though, the Montana Grizzlies. I told you I saw a game there once. Hey, you were a baby, probably. Well, but as we go out, I'm going up there for the game, and not this weekend, but next weekend. Your boy is getting a little Hall of Fame induction. That hasn't next happened week. yet. That's next weekend Ooh. against Northern Colorado, baby. I'm out next week. I'm going to Montana, baby. Don't leave me alone now. Well, I was going to finish today with congratulating you. I thought you'd already gone in, so that happens no, next, next week. week, man. Man, Hall of Famer Mark Mariani. <laughs> Montana Grizzlies, baby. Up with Montana, boy. All this time. Now, got, see, I there's got the positivity. There, there it go. is. The optimism. It took two hours, but we're here, baby. Two-tone blue nation. We got to go. So in the meantime. In between time. Peace. peace.